Hi everyone. Uh, today we are here again with uh, another topic, which is more critical and most ignored many time. I have seen that people are not very focused. Today podcast topic, we have selected customer focus during an acquisition. And to do that, you know, I am going to talk today with very important and very passionate about Apple products <laughs> and Matt here today. Matt is a part of a corporate development team uh, and it's, it's a company called Jam. And I'm going to you know, ask a couple of very interesting questions about how this customer focus is very critical for the success of the deal and how, what is the view of Matt? So Matt, welcome to you and good morning. Good morning. So if you just give about your profile, you know, and uh, in fact, this topic itself is so interesting. If you can give some, you know, introduction about uh, yourself, your role, and how you see this topic is so critical, that would be good for our audience. Yeah, so uh, Matt Arsenault, uh, I'm head of corporate development at, at a company called Jamp, as you mentioned, um, uh, but have been around M&A since about 2007, um, have been a consultant on the accounting and, and kind of business side, mm -hmm. uh, valuations, uh, have been in finance roles around acquisitions, um, led uh, integration management, um, and, and, and am on a deal team now. So a uh, pretty interesting perspective across uh, a number of different uh, aspects of M&A. Uh, and and I, I'm excited about today's topic of customer-centric M&A because a lot of companies will focus on either the people they're acquiring, the employees, the technology, or, or the kind of costing and synergy elements. And, and they leave the softer synergies around revenue kind of to chance in, in a lot of cases, um, and especially when it comes to customer retention. And so... Uh, the idea of the customer as a key stakeholder in, in m and is something that's really, uh, I, I learned a lot about while I was at a company called Everbridge, um, because you had to start to think about uh, how that customer would feel through the acquisition. Um, I, I say a lot that an employee's decision in an m and is, is somewhat limited, and, and so treating them through that change management process is day one is the first day that they have ever gone through this type of transition and are gonna work for a company um, that they have not chosen. On the customer side, however, almost every customer has gone through a situation where one of their major vendors or one of their major partners uh, has been acquired or acquired something. And so they all have an idea about what M&A is going to do to disrupt the relationship. Um, and you might be fighting against uh, the, the stigma of everybody else before you. Yeah. Um, and so this idea of, of uh, promoting the customer to a, to a key stakeholder in M&A is something that, that is very important um, in, in the technology industry, especially in the SaaS uh, space, mm -hmm. and something that, that I, I think is a really important topic to, to continue to understand. Right. So I think, you know, I think partially you have already answered my first question, but, you know, just to uh, give some more emphasis on that, you know, how are customer stakeholders in M&A? <laughs> they, they are the primary value driver of the business and the, the M&A case, right? Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, they, they are the thing that puts a dollar back into uh, the, the model, yeah. right? And, and a lot of times companies will sort of take that historical revenue and just trend it, right? You, you get to a very high level aggregate where each individual customer or their behavior um, is not really understood. Outside of kind of understanding who your kind of top 20 customers are or top 25 customers are. Mm -hmm. And so though those customers become a key stakeholder in a couple of different ways. The first is they're going to have an opinion about what the the product or service should change too now that you've you've bought something. Mm -hmm. So having them as a feedback mechanism to talk about um, and test some of the thesis of, of your investment plan, I think is, is a really important step as them as a stakeholder. 
The other area where they are a stakeholder is sort of an ongoing, right? Um, you have to win that customer over, not just with your first communication, but throughout the transition. And they have to understand uh, that you have a plan and that you, you're getting there. So they are a great stakeholder uh, for an outside perspective on, on how the integration is going and how the, the businesses are coming together. And the final kind of area of being a stakeholder is ultimately how they provide feedback through renewal or upsell, right? So they provide additional upside in a lot of these models by buying other products or, or right. spending more for the joint product. Mm -hmm. um, and so ultimately they will vote with their dollars and become a stakeholder in that way where they can drive additional growth for companies um, and, mm -hmm. and further enhance the, the M&A process and life cycle. Yeah. So... <laughs> So my next question to you is, we go and define M&A process across, you know, while you are like doing any m and Now, how this m and process will interact with the customer success framework for the companies? I, I think um, m and has to be very clearly aligned to, to the customer success framework. Mm -hmm. um, I think the thesis that you have in a deal about how you hand it to a sales team or to a customer success or an account management team it is really important. Um, how quickly the synergies come into the model with that upsell cross-sell motion is important. And so understanding your own company's interactions with customers, right? Is there a customer communications team? Is there a customer marketing team? Is there a partner marketing team, a partner management team? Um, how how do you have interactions with those customers on a consistent basis? Um, are your customer success people commissioned or, or quoted, mm -hmm. right? Are they expected to sell something or are they really there to enable the transition of a customer or, or the success of a customer? Aligning to those goals of your organization throughout an M&A and understanding the differences in approach between the acquiring company and the acquired company is really, mm -hmm. really important because a company that has a, a customer success focus that is more closely tied to sales, for instance, yes. as opposed mm -hmm. to customer support or product, and, a, and an acquired company that's the other side, that's more closely aligned to customer support or product, you know, the call in to that customer to sell them something may be seen as overreaching, right? So yeah, you really have right. to understand yeah. the customer success framework and, and the way that you interact with customers on both sides of the transaction mm -hmm. and make sure you adjust to the customer profile. Mm -hmm. Now to do that, you have to understand a couple of key things about the, the customer base, right? Uh, how much of the customer base is overlapped? How much of the customer base is new? Um, how much of each of the company's customer base is in, is in pipeline for the other, right? Yeah. So understanding the relationship of, of a target or a customer relative to both sides of the transaction is also really important to understand how used to the standard approach that your customer success team might take and therefore unlock the value in, in a meaningful way without creating that, that significant element of change or, or contrast um, that might be felt by the customer as a result of just taking the acquiring company's approach to an M&A customer. So, you know, just related to this, I have another question, maybe, uh, you know, it's linked to the second question, but how important is embedding consideration of the customer experience an integral part of planning during acquisitions? It, 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 it becomes a very important part of the value proposition, uh, the strategy of the overall deal, um, the potential uh, upside of a deal, right? So it might not be in the base case, uh, but it certainly should be in an upside or a downside case, right? So understanding uh, that customer experience and, and how different that experience is across the platforms or across the interactions with the company, right? Mm -hmm. um, if, if you're in an organization that's a product first company where sales is more of an enabler of, of the customer. Yeah. Um, that's a different experience than if you're in a sales first cu culture where, you know, uh, it's always about the next deal or the next upsell. 
And so understanding that experience, not just in the product or with the product, Mm -hmm. but the overall customer experience, as I mentioned, with how often are you communicating? How are you communicating to your customers? Is it through email? Is it through quarterly checkpoints? Um, Is it on a text message basis, right? Is is your, your sales rep and the key user of your platform on a texting basis, right? Right. That cultural difference or that understanding of what is the overall customer experience with your company Mm -hmm. is really important to understand. And and in a lot of ways, other people who I've listened to on on a number of different podcasts talk about making sure that you do diligence on yourself first. Mm -hmm. You have to understand that experience and how that customer has an experience with your company first. So you can understand how different it can be in the acquired company. Yeah. That's why I have seen that, you know, we do very good communication kit for the customers so that during acquisition, we <laughs> make sure that we don't miss some important part. And this goes as a communication kit, like what to, uh, what to communicate, when to communicate, what content to communicate. So I think this is all very important points to, you know, seeing that. So I have, you know. It's just one more point on that. It, the other consideration is how long to keep up long. that communication, right? Yes. Because yeah. Again, at an acquisition, you tend to over communicate. Um, yeah, sometimes. And if you keep doing that for a year or two yeah. years after you acquire, <laughs> yeah. there is a level of exhaustion, right? So, exactly. so that, that, that idea of what to communicate, how, what content to communicate, but also understand that you are over communicating during the transition phase somewhat intentionally yeah. Yeah. and being thoughtful about how you wind down that extra touch point or extra mm-hmm. level of communication. Right, got it. So, you know, my next question in this series is, you know, what are the typical challenges arising in sustaining customer engagement during any acquisitions? I, I mentioned one uh, very uh, quickly yeah. previously, which is mm-hmm. ultimately most customers have an idea of how m and goes and, and right. a lot of them feel ignored or they feel the pain of a changing integration plan, right? Yeah. And, and as a company or as a corp dev team, if you're not adapting your integration plan as you go through it, yeah. you're not really, you, you're not optimizing that process, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But the customer as a stakeholder is often the one that gets the message last. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and so again, they, they have those bruises of, well, the last time one of my you know, favorite vendors did this, they told me nothing was going to change. And then six months later, the end of life of my product. Yeah. Right. Like why? Like, I don't understand. Yeah. You aren't going to do that to me. Mm-hmm. Are you, you know, your letter looks a lot like the letter I got last time. And, yeah. and I don't. Right? So, so one of the challenges is coming through that, that experience of the customer and what, what it means. Um, the other challenge of engagement is, is based on how different the product or service might be. Right. So mm-hmm. if you buy something that is a natural extension, is it, is sort of a, a part of a workflow it's a lot easier to keep those customers engaged because you're trying to transition them to a, to a more complete right. product right. or service. Um, if it's a, a adjacent product or service um, where it might be a different person in mm-hmm. a organization, right? Yeah. You, you might be selling to the IT team on your core, core product. And this is a cybersecurity product where you sell to the CISO and the information security team. Right. Now the problem becomes you have to keep not just the logo of a yeah. customer engaged. Right. You have to keep each stakeholder of a customer engaged. Right. And I do think that that's another level that gets a little bit ignored in M&A is the persona or the user of the software. Mm-hmm. Where is the key decision maker? How do you make sure that you're not just sending the communications that we talked about to your legacy guy yeah. at the company yeah. Yeah. and ignoring you know, the woman on the other side of the transaction, who's really now wondering, and she might not know the other person um, who you communicated to. So making sure that you're not just sending the notifications and engaging the logo of a customer, but the actual users and stakeholders of the product. Right. I think that is more, you know, kind of uh, personal relations, building with customers. Sometime you are, you know, maybe a new person comes and you have to engage with existing customers. And during acquisition, that is another problem I have seen that people keep changing, right? Suddenly the guy who I've been talking to customer, he's no more 
you know the main point of contact for customers so that is another big challenge i have seen okay so now coming to the next question which i had is you know what are the different way to deliver value to the customer in the most judicial manner during the deal making process i think this starts at the very start yeah. of the acquisition yeah right and and that what i mean by that is the the selection of a space to move into mm -hmm. the the sourcing of companies mm -hmm. right you should be talking to your customers way before you even have a deal on the table to understand what is it that they want from you mm -hmm. right and that could be through normal you know customer feedback sessions that could be through requests for enhancements or or other mm -hmm. product requests um that could be just ideas of what other software should be tied to your software or what other product makes sense to be put into your product. Yeah. <laughs> and so engaging that customer early to test your thesis, test mm. your idea of, would you want to buy this new thing from yeah. me is really important. And, and that's also where that stakeholder question comes in, right? right. Um, because your stakeholder who might be using your platform might say, yeah, no, I don't need that. But his boss or his boss's boss might say, oh, that would be amazing, right? Yeah. So making sure that you're able to engage multiple layers of your customer and understand mm -hmm. what their visions are for how things are going to change or come together or what things could enhance your product and, and build that. Mm -hmm. And so ultimately an M&A transaction should center around this idea of additional customer value. Exactly. And, and whether it's a technology first deal where you say, oh, I really love this company because they have tech, uh, or if it's, it's because you see a new market and you want to grow into that market, mm -hmm. the center of that decision or the person who understands that application of the technology of the product is that user or end customer. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so making sure that they are, are in early, especially the ones you trust, mm -hmm. um, that is a really important way to deliver value. And then I think the interesting part of this question for me was in a, in a judicious or, or, or quick manner, right? Quick manner, yeah. And I do think that the, the statement is, is, is somewhat subjective. What I think is more important is delivering value in the timeline communicated, mm -hmm. right? So you don't necessarily want to be able to say, okay, the day after we close this deal, you're going to find value because that's not how this yeah. works, right? Yeah. Um, the platforms have to come together over time. The, the, the processes and procedures and people mm -hmm. need to come together over time. What you need to be able to do is understand that timeline and clearly communicate it to your customer base so that you're, you're providing the value that you promised or right. was communicated to that customer in the timeline that you've effectively set for that customer. Even if that timeline isn't day one, mm -hmm. first quarter, yeah. first year, you have to be very clear on on what that intention is mm -hmm. and and again if it isn't quick yeah. why what are what are the considerations you're taking in place and a lot of customers will understand the difficulty and complexity of bringing things together but they want to know that you're you're hitting your say do ratio is very high right, right. i said right. i was going to get you this value i said i was going to do it by q4 of this year and in Q4 of this year, I hand you the joint product and, and everything is great. Right. I, I think uh, one important point, which I uh, personally feel that, you know, if customers are aware of the strategic intent of the deal, why this acquisition, how it's going to add value in short term and long term, I think they are fine. What is critical is communicate early, communicate exactly what is the value add, when they are going to get. And at least they should be aware in advance so that their sales process, their, you know, because they might be talking to some channel partner or somebody internal stakeholders. So they have all the information to communicate. So I think that is a, a critical part, which I think that it's very important. Now have- it, it is, And especially in an instance where it changes. Yes. Right. Exactly. And, and again, that idea of over communicating why the change was made, yeah. what happens. Um, that's the, the, the important part is mm -hmm. all these plans are dynamic mm -hmm. and making sure that you're upfront with your customers about that, right? right. This is our intention at this time, mm -hmm. but we are still doing work to understand if there are additional enhancements that could come to the product, right? right. 
um, making sure that you're you're open about that idea that it will change and that 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 change mm -hmm. is intended to be more beneficial to them yeah. is an important thing so that they understand that this isn't a, a firm commitment of this exact thing. Right, right. So we have spoke about, uh, you know, that customer focus during acquisition is so critical and many times it doesn't happen or it's just ignored and people are not focusing much. So my next question from you is, how does customer focus can improve the success of uh, acquisitions? It, it, it really is about that synergy that a lot of people are afraid to put into their model, yeah. right? The, the cross-sell, upsell, and uh, kind of the increase of the average selling price into your customer base, the um, number of products per customer, right? Yeah. A lot of customer, a lot of companies strive to increase that, right? Like I want a, a customer that pays me more and buys more of my stuff. Yeah. Um, if you do your M&A well and you put the customer at the center of that acquisition, now they they are more willing to try the next thing you want to do, whether that be through another M&A or through a, an organic product launch um, or, or a potential partnership, right? I think that it gives you additional upside and it really produces that um, pull through from the customer that says, you know, yeah, last time you, you told me you were going to give me this value. I saw even more value. Yeah. When are you going to give me that new thing next? Right. Right. And, and that's really where that outsized value of putting the customer first comes mm -hmm. is when they do start to buy anything and everything, right? I, I've used it in the past examples of ServiceNow or Salesforce, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, or, or even Microsoft, right? Mm -hmm. like nobody thought, you know, putting LinkedIn into Microsoft made much sense. Yeah, but it does, yeah. um, and and it and it drives that that business and that idea of it, and and so that additional synergy or or the ability to make somebody more aware of this as as a part of our portfolio and mm -hmm. an ability to buy more from that portfolio is really <laughs> important, and and it can be derailed very quickly through M and A, because there are usually processes for launching a new a mm -hmm. new. In organic product yeah. that take time, that are very thoughtful, that are very clear. Um, you know, the product is fully sort of ready to go, or the service mm -hmm. is fully baked. Yeah. Um, in an MA, it, it isn't, right? Because you, you're two separate companies until the day you close. Yeah. And as, as much as the theory stands of, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, 10 out of 10 of our customers have both <laughs> of these products, right. they're connected to each other. So they would love it. Sometimes they don't, right? Yep, and so you, you have to take that customer feedback and understand that there is a bigger risk on the M&A side of launching mm -hmm. a new product. Um, so there's also the downside or outsized downside risk of, of trying to add too much too quickly to M&A. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so since we are talking about customer success, how we can you know, really, they can add value to you know, our overall deal. So my ne next question is more on how we are going to ensure that all matrices and incentive in M&A are aligned to ensure customer retention. And, and this does get back to that original point of mine about uh, the internal diligence first, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you have to understand how your retention is. What is your customer satisfaction scores? Yeah. Um, what are the things that you do um, in order to have touch points with customers? Um, and those metrics are, are going to be on both sides of a transaction. You have to start to make sure that both companies have somewhat standardized mm -hmm. metrics, right? Um, if one company is very focused on gross retention and the other is very focused on net retention, there could be some conflict there, mm -hmm. right? Because, yeah. you know, one company is just worried about keeping what they have and they're not going to, to really push for that upsell. Mm -hmm. The other company would give away a customer to get another one to spend 100% more, right? Yeah. And so you, those, those diligence activities and those alignments of those metrics and the change management around those metric changes mm -hmm. is, is really the, the key point yeah. of the MNA. Mm -hmm. And understanding what 
both sides of the company are doing well and what they're not doing well, not doing right? Well. Yeah. Because again, in a change management process, you're able to take and, and change the process for both sides mm-hmm. and potentially improve it. So managing through that change and making sure that the metrics align to your goal, in this case, you know, the retention of the customers, yeah. you know, you may make trade-offs, right? That say, hey, we're really focused on retention in this instance. Therefore, I don't want my sales team to reach out to upsell this customer base until they are stabilized in the integration right. plan. So also making sure you understand the priority of your metrics um, and, and which ones are able to be subjected to the others in a prioritization throughout the M&A is also a really important activity, right? Um, you can't have a list of 45 metrics that are all the most important metric or, or you don't hit any of them. Right. So understanding what your top three to five metrics are, mm-hmm. that will help drive the strategy of the integration that will help drive the model for the financials mm-hmm. and it will help drive the priority and behavior of the people around the M&A mm-hmm. in order to drive the results that you want. Right. <coughs> so I think it's important to the, you know have the priority, maybe top three you start and then we look at the next three or something like that, right? That will be the best approach. It, yeah, it's, it's also understanding which metrics are elements of others mm, yeah. and which ones are leading versus lagging, right? right. So, so for instance, ARR or uh, annual recurring revenue is one that's a very big SaaS metric, mm-hmm. but that's made up of new contract sales and net retention. Right. And net retention is made up of upsell and gross retention, Yeah. right? So if you're, man- if you're trying to manage all five of those at the same time and, and looking at it, mm-hmm. you're not able to, to get there, right? Like um, ARR is, is a lagging indicator, whereas yeah. some of these others are input. So yeah. you want to be able to concentrate on the metrics and understand how they interact and, mm-hmm. and how they will signal those elements. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's important to have that understanding because, you know, just focusing on or trying to dra- drive ARR mm-hmm. without driving those other elements or mm-hmm. understanding where the issues in those other elements might be yeah. will mean that you're never going to drive ARR. Mm-hmm. And so those are, the, those are the thought processes of what are the right metrics, but which ones are leading, which ones are lagging, and which metrics support other metrics in your goals yeah. And then again, as, as we sort of talked about, if, if it is retention that we were worried about, then maybe new annual contract value isn't a focus in a certain period in the M&A mm-hmm. model and in the integration plan. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So now we have, uh, you know, another question. I, I, I know most of these are linked to each other because lots of dependency on this question. So what is the right time uh, and the right stage for to engage customer during the time of change in the M&A. There is any time you feel that is more critical to engage and focus on customer fo- uh, success, or what is your experience? In this? It, 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 and and as a public company, I think that there are there are elements of this, and and honestly, even as a private company, you don't want to go across some of the things that Europe or DOJ has out there of acting as a single company before close. So I think that there is a lot of preparation, uh, as I mentioned, talking to some key customers or joint customers early, talking about how you want to enhance the partnership. So engaging a small number of customers Mm -hmm. upfront to to try um, to build out those those pieces uh, of the theory. I think broad customer outreach has to be done as early as possible, right? So close um, as soon as you can. Um, And then it it really is based on the culture of the customers and the relationship with both sides of the company, right? Mm -hmm. If the customers are used to being talked to on a daily basis, you you better have something ready to go every day. Uh, If a customer is used to being checked in once a quarter, you may not want to do every day a different email and an update, right? So you want to be able to engage those customers as early as possible. And then fit the culture or the the sort of elements of the customer relationships on both sides, which may mean you have asynchronous communications, right? Which 
becomes weird for joint customers. Mm-hmm. Um, but if, again, you have a weekly email that goes out to your customers and they have a monthly newsletter that goes out to their customers, you, you better keep that process of communication because that's your best mm-hmm. chance of reaching as many as possible. Right. So what I understood that it's a, it's a start early in the game, like whenever you are starting a new deal, I think customers have an important part to play because all your communication, planning, strategy, all you know the frequency of communication, they all are <laughs> critical and that had to be planned from the beginning itself, right? Okay. Yes. So, you know, my ne- next question is, I think it's also a related one, but how imp- important is embedding consideration of customer experience in integral part of planning during acquisitions? I, I think it hits every element of planning yeah, and right. you're doing it right, right? So it, it should hit, again, upfront, the, the strategy around the, the markets that you would go into. The sourcing, right? Um, how do customers feel about certain companies within the space you want to go into? Um, the, the integration plan, right? Like uh, how close are the platforms or are the end users the same? And therefore we should have one platform versus right. many different many, platforms. Yeah. Um, so the customer experience and the customer consideration from a product perspective starts early and, and kind of goes mm-hmm. through. From an interaction perspective, that's also important, right? So as we mentioned, how, how are the customers used to interacting with the buyer and the seller? Um, that experience is, is not just product experience, but customer support. Um, are, are we used to having somebody talk to us about our problems in local language, but yeah. the acquirer only has people talking in English? Yeah. Are we used to um, you know, a Slack bot that will give me an answer right away? Or do we feel like we have to have a person on the phone? Right, that experience of how a customer makes a touch point with the company and the differences have to be built into the plan so that you can understand how you need to modify your overall approach to customer success, customer support to meet the needs of these new customers. And again, when I use the word customer here, it is not the logo, it's the end user or the decision maker or the the person interacting with your product or service. And so that's a much more personal level um, yeah. that you have to make those interactions um, because you could have the best product in the world, but if your customer thinks you're ignoring what they want or what yeah. they need, and, and yeah. again, that person or individual on the other side, they'll go to your competitor pretty quickly. Yeah. And so that idea of making sure that not only is the customer experience with the product or in the product mm-hmm. um, is important, but how that person is feeling about the transition, the change management, the elements. And so, you know, um, specific cert customer surveys around um, imp- I- I- indications of, of M&A, right? Yeah. Getting that feedback, making sure that they are part of that process and that improvement process and, and, and part of the change management mm-hmm. is an, a very, very important part of the considerations not just for planning in a singular acquisition, Mm -hmm. but then, okay, what can we do better next time? So they start up front in an M&A, they're through the integration and integration planning Mm -hmm. and and through that customer satisfaction or customer survey uh, aspects at the end of an M&A, they should be already helping you to start to plan what you would do differently in the next one. Yeah. So, you know, it's pretty interesting uh, (laughs) that lots of important points. I would like to also ask, uh, you know, what will the two to three takeaway for our audience, which are more critical for this, if we can give yeah. some takeaway, which we can, you know, our MA community can really use them. I, I think the, 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 the biggest one that, that, that we've talked about and, and that I, I fundamentally believe is a customer is not a logo, it is the people within that customer, mm-hmm. right? So understanding the individuals you interact with in, at that level uh, and, and leveraging the broader reach of your team on both sides of the transaction in order to get to as many of those people as possible, right? Not just a code letter from Corp Dev that says, hey, we bought this thing, it's super awesome. Um, but using and, and building out that interactions at the personal level is, is really important. The, the second thing is, um, 
what what you can't measure, you, you can't drive, right? So making sure that you understand the metrics and, and the way that the, the company measures or incentivizes behavior on both sides of a transaction as it relates to customers and, and taking this opportunity to improve on both sides of the transaction. And the final piece is the customer should be part of every element of M&A um, and, and be a touch point at each sort of transition phase of the M&A life cycle mm -hmm. from early strategy through planning for your next one um, and make sure that you have those trusted customers that you, you can reach out to in order to, to test some ideas with. Right, right. Thanks. Uh, I think this was a great point. And that these are great uh, inputs for our audience who are listening. And thanks, Matt, for your time. We are going to come back with another episode. We'll also find a very interesting topic, which is you know something like uh, customer focus, but maybe uh, in different contexts. <laughs> So let's be in touch and thanks for your time today.